Hi, I'm Deborah Holchip, editor of Michigan Today. In this episode of Listen in Michigan, you'll hear the story of one of the university's most distinguished and courageous alumni, World War II hero Raoul Wallenberg. His story could be a John le Carré novel. Wallenberg, an architect and the son of a wealthy Swedish family, disappeared without a trace in Budapest in 1945, shortly after the war came to a close there. Just a decade out of Michigan, this charming architect had volunteered for a diplomatic mission in Hungary, using his credentials as a Swedish businessman, not to mention his wits, charisma, and brilliance, to build a clandestine international network of safe houses and counterfeit documents to protect thousands of Jews from the Nazis. But once the Russians rolled into Budapest, Wallenberg was detained by Soviet authorities, and the facts of his demise and disappearance remain a mystery to this day. At the University of Michigan, we celebrate Wallenberg's bravery and legacy each year and award a medal in his name to a humanitarian like him who's seeking to make a better world. John Godfrey is Assistant Dean for International Education here at the Rackham Graduate School, and he's our resident expert on Wallenberg. This year, he and the medal committee selected two organizations as Wallenberg medal recipients, the Parkland, Florida high school students who founded the movement March for Our Lives, and the Young People of Chicago's BRAVE, an acronym that stands for Bold Resistance Against Violence Everywhere. Both groups are led by passionate, idealistic youth who are seeking to end gun violence and affect political and social change. Listen in as John tells the thrilling story of Wallenberg's wartime adventures and explains why the committee chose to bestow its 26th medal on these bold young Americans. Here's John. Raoul Wallenberg uh, came to the University of Michigan in 1931 to study architecture as an undergraduate. He came from Sweden took a ship across the Atlantic, grabbed a train in New York City, and ended up in Ann Arbor. Lugged his uh, suitcases up to the steps of Angel Hall and said this was going to be home for the next several years. He was a student in architecture, which then was located in what today is Lorch Hall. And uh, they had studios up in the top, and he spent a lot of time up there. He lived in boarding houses, uh, as most students did back then. For Academically, he was a terrific student. He won. And when he graduated, the silver medal from the uh, Architects Institute of America in recognition of his uh, qualities as an architect. He was a, he was a, a really wonderful uh, artist. I feel like we have a photograph of him drawing, don't we? We had, I don't know if we have one of him drawing. We have most of the photographs we have of him on campus. He it is a well-known one. He's yourself. perched on the steps of Angel Hall. Uh, there's others, he, and, and these are snapshots to send home to his mom back in Stockholm. He was charming, he was very funny, uh, he was uh, highly poised, he was comfortable in virtually every situation. So he was a, a very engaging, warm person who was highly respected and loved and had lots of friends, and he would go visit people, hitchhike, show up at their house in Chicago or New York or elsewhere. And he came from a, a wealthy family, and he was sort of expected to follow in the family's uh, business, basically? Or Yes, he came from uh, was Sweden's um, preeminent family, a uh, family of industrialists, bankers, uh, diplomats, uh, church leaders. It was a hugely distinguished and well-known family. He, in a way, he sought out anonymity so he could be himself. So none of, none of his fellow students had any idea about his background. They just called him Rudy. They thought Rudy Wallenberg from Sweden someplace, you know, <laughs> some kid who shows up. Okay, welcome. So he was just determined to live an ordinary university, American university life, to be anonymous, to be himself, to make his own decisions, to not have to live up to anybody else's expectations. And he, f he sought and found, I think, the independence that he really craved. Well, thank goodness he had those happy years here because then his life really took a turn. I mean, it's, it's like a thriller. What he ended up doing 10 years after he graduated is extraordinary. It's, it's remarkable and it's tragic. But the qualities that he developed and showed while he was a student here, his poise, his adaptability, his calmness, uh, his, his creativity, really enabled him to do remarkable things mm -hmm. 10 years later in Budapest during the Second World War. He encountered an American diplomat 
in 1944 in Stockholm who mentioned that he was on a mission from Franklin Delano Roosevelt to try and make some arrangements to send someone from Sweden. And Sweden, of course, he's neutral, people weren't engaged in the war, who could travel to Budapest where they knew that the last large, the largest surviving community of Jews was, was in place and had not yet been deported to the death camps. And Wallenberg volunteered. He, at this time, he was fluent in German and French and English and Swedish, of course. And he'd studied Russian. And uh, he also had a business uh, affair with a Hungarian businessman. And he he developed some facility with Hungarian, which is uh, a complicated language, shall we say. <laughs> and within a couple of months, he found himself heading to Budapest through war-torn Europe with a diplomatic passport and a satchel stuffed with a large amount of cash and many different currencies. And he arrived in, in Budapest in 1944, in July 1944, uh, just as um, the Soviet, the Russian army, was approaching from the east. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the Germans were determined to carry out the uh, final solution and uh, liquidate the last remaining community of Jews in Budapest. So he set about organizing a, a, a form of resistance, a way to protect and to hide uh, as m and shelter as many Jews as he could in the city. And he found a number of diplomats from uh, other countries as well, Sweden and other independent countries that were there, or neutral countries rather. There were representatives of Sweden and Japan and uh, Spain and Switzerland and the Vatican. And there was, there was a small cluster of diplomats who had been developing uh, passports, fake identities, and issuing them to Jews and who could then claim that they were citizens of or under the protection of a neutral country. And they could not be arrested, detained, and deported and sent to death camps. And uh, Wallenberg threw himself into this and uh, moved the production of these false passports to a new scale and organized a, a community of, uh, of resistance within Budapest. Uh, he recruited dozens of young couriers uh, who would distribute these to people who needed them. He also took some of his money and he bought houses, apartment buildings. And he is today, as we know, if an embassy of a foreign country in, say, in the United States is uh, that considered to be the territory of that nation mm. and not of the United States. So when you enter an embassy, you're entering the grounds of another nation. And Wallenberg creatively bought up a number of these buildings and said, these are now officially part of the Swedish embassy and the Swedish compound. So these are Swedish soil. And anyone inside them is under Swedish law and cannot be detained. And so he br packed in many hundreds of people. He brought so them out. So smart into these places to try to save them. So Budapest deteriorated rapidly into one of the bloodiest battles of the Second World War as the Soviet army put the city under siege in, uh, from October 1944. And the rate of murders uh, grew very quickly. Adolf Eichmann, a yeah. senior commander of the SS, had been sent by Hitler to liquidate the remaining Jewish community. And uh, Wallenberg and his allies were doing everything they could to stymie him at every turn. This is 10 years after he had left Ann Arbor. Yeah, so he's probably late 20s, maybe, early 30s? He's in his early 30s. Uh, and he would make the rounds through his safe houses. And he had a network of couriers who were working effectively. And his couriers were distributing food and medicine and papers, documents to Jews in hiding throughout the city. And they could see uh, the bright flashes of Russian gunfire, of artillery in the distance. And they knew the siege was approaching the city. And Wallenberg was reminiscing and told his driver of the story when he was a student at Michigan about having been held up at gunpoint while hitchhiking back from Chicago to Ann Arbor. And we know a little bit about this incident because he wrote his mother about it. He wrote this letter very calmly relating how he had <laughs> been held up and saying, don't worry, Mom, I was not worried at all. I was very calm. Uh, and I knew I could talk my way out of it. <laughs> and and that's what Wallenberg was doing mm -hmm. in Budapest 10 years later. He was bribing German soldiers, Hungarian officials. He was threatening them. Uh, he was blackmailing them. <laughs> he was um, convincing any way he could that, that the Jews were not to be touched. Despite his efforts, 
the city really descended into complete bloody chaos as the siege tightened and tightened. Hungarian fascist militias roamed the streets murdering people. Mm. It was a truly, truly apocalyptic scene. And in this, in this tragic and desperate moments, uh, Wallenberg managed to keep his network alive. He became a symbol of hope throughout the city for Jews, mm -hmm. many of whom had never laid eyes on him. But they knew that Wallenberg was working and that he was their last slim hope. The end of the war came over the, for Budapest came in uh, January 1945 when the Soviet army seized the city and drove the Nazis out and their allies out. And Wallenberg was summoned to Russian military headquarters and he went with his driver and w evidently was detained and disappeared. We don't know what happened with him with any f certainty or with either of them. Uh, the best evidence suggests that he was eventually murdered by the Soviets in a prison in Moscow in 1947, although there has been no final confirmation of his fate. Isn't that amazing? It's a horrifying story for him, for everyone who was involved, for the city of Budapest, for the Jews mm, of Budapest, God. and to have someone who gave his, his, his full measure to save as many lives as he could to meet that kind of fate is it's a doubly tragic. It's very difficult with the record to determine who saved how many and what. Mm -hmm. This is, and he would have been the first to say that this was a collective effort shared by diplomats, by some citizens of Budapest, by Jewish residents themselves, the Jewish community. This was truly a collective effort. Maybe as many as 100,000 Jews, well, we do know about 100 and 110,000 Jews, I think, survived the war. How many of those lives can be directly attributable to actions that Wallenberg himself took? Uh, that is, the, I don't see any way reasonably to determine that. Um, but he no doubt, by survivors, by the testimony of survivors, including other diplomats, he was the extraordinarily courageous leader of the effort that made a huge difference. And the descendants of those people are alive today around the world. It's, I think it's important for us uh, you know, here at Michigan to, you know, we have you know, our Wallenberg Medal, which is just the 26th has, has been awarded. Uh, but, and we remember who he is. Mm -hmm. But he is remembered around the world. There are monuments to his memory in most capital cities in Europe. Uh, there are streets and plazas and schools that bear his name. In Gothenburg, Sweden, in Jotavare, Sweden, there is a, uh, a, I think, a particularly touching memorial, which is built around his freshman photograph at the University of Michigan. And it's, um, it's particularly touching because it shows how young he yeah. was when he chose this path. Uh, when he brought all of his, who he was, all of his capabilities to the most extraordinary and terrifying challenge that anyone could imagine. Wow. Well, that is an interesting segue to the recipients that you uh, selected this year, who are also very young, very charming, very articulate. They've seen horrific and been through horrific things. Um, talk a bit about the the people who received the medal this year, why you chose them, and, and kind of what sort of feedback you got as a result. It's a controversial topic, but it's also amazing to see these young people take up this cause. So, yeah, this year the Wallenberg Committee decided that for the first time the medal would be awarded to two organizations, to an organization. The medal has always gone to individuals. But this time, uh, this year, the Wallenberg Committee felt that we as a country are facing uh, an acute crisis uh, with the uh, number of uh, particularly mass killings that are taking place around the country. And that it was important to recognize organizations that were led by young people that have taken very, very strong stands. Uh, March for Our Lives, which was organized by the students from Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, which had this terrible killing earlier this year. And we had uh, Sophie Whitney and Alex Wind. And 
brave youth leaders of Chicago, South Chicago, sent two remarkable students mm. who came to Ann Arbor to receive the medal on behalf of their organizations. The Brave Youth Leaders of South Chicago is an organization located in St. In St. Sabina's Church, which is a, a legendary platform for social justice in Chicago. And the these are people, young people, who face uh, gun violence every day. And the Parkland teenagers are ones who have seen the most horrific eruption, an unexpected eruption of gun violence within the safety of their schools. And in face of this, of the, of this violence, they have devoted themselves to organizing uh, and, and bringing the attention of this, this issue to the attention of, of the communities in which they live, nas nationwide, and to political leaders to try and affect change. They are creative, passionate, imaginative, fiercely persistent, and those are the, exactly the kinds of qualities that Raoul Wallenberg brought when he faced his final challenge in Budapest. Tremendous energy, drive, refusal to, to back down. Um, well, you know, Rihanna Holman and Kishan Newman from uh, Brave Youth Leaders, uh, on the stage of Rackham Auditorium, where one would expect 16-year-olds to be intimidated, they spoke with such directness and such poise from the truth of their own experiences and with, with such charismatic wit and mm -hmm. directness. I thought it was a very, very powerful evening. We're a university, and we see, the committee sees these as having a fundamental didactic, an instructional purpose mm -hmm. for us to come together as a community to think about urgent, important problems with people who are at the front lines and have put their lives in the front lines of these things. And how do we understand them? How do we, how, how, how can we think of ourselves and our responsibilities as members of this university and members of our larger community in addressing these things? And it's a reminder to all of us that we all have that capacity if we're willing to tap into it. If we've, but you know, you have to have the courage and the vision and you gotta wonder where it comes from. But we all have it, right? I mean, it's a reminder that you can be one ordinary person, whether it's Gandhi or Martin Luther King, has the power to change the world. Well, you have to make the decision about what am I going to do? That's, you know, it's been said that the highest civic virtue is courage. And these are ordinary people who have made a choice to make a difference. And that step requires courage. And take, to take that step requires not only courage, but courageous persistence. That's for sure. It's the, it's the willingness to persist in the face of adversity, in the face of naysayers, in the face of all kinds of challenges. I guess that one of, you know, the through line that connects so many of our medalists is people who have, who have a, an intellectual and an emotional recognition of the vulnerability of, of humankind. And the variety of challenges that we face and we have to overcome collectively. Uh, these, are, these are important prophetic voices and we need to heed them. Wow, it's always reassuring to talk with someone like John at a time when the world feels a little unmoored. And to remember there are still people out there like Raoul Wallenberg and the young activists in March for Our Lives and Brave. You can find more Listen in Michigan podcasts at Google Play Music, iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn. Or you can go to michigantoday.umich.edu and click Podcast under the Topics tab. Okay, thanks for listening. Till next time, as always, go blue.